Welcome to Boxing During Dinner, and, and as you can tell, this is not Alex's apartment. We're here at Rondazzo's Little Italy in Coral Gables, Florida, and we're here with the owner and chef, Mark Rondazzo, former fighter. Mark, welcome to Boxing During Dinner. Thank you. Nice to be here. Thank you. And Mark's cooked up a hell of a dish for us. Mark, what, what did you cook tonight? Well, this is a, a typical dish that uh, in any Little Italy across America that we have every Sunday. This is a homemade meatball, which is uh, my mother's secret recipe. I have homemade sausage that I make here in the restaurant. I have some pork shoulder. And here I have stuffed brajol, which is stuffed with uh, raisins, pine nuts, uh, Romano cheese, and parsley. And then it cooks slow in a gravy all day long. It's like any Italian family has every uh, weekend in their home. Even up in Rochester, they do this. <laughs> And that looks amazing, Mark. And uh, while we serve ourselves and uh, and and start the show, we're gonna we're gonna send it to David in Rochester. David, this is amazing. I, I don't know what what your probably what your mom cooked for you tonight, but uh, we'll, we'll we'll go to Rochester, David. What what are you what are you eating tonight? Well, congratulations, Armando. Yes, you're having a delicious Italian meal at Rondazzo's. I'm sure you're very happy about that. Me, tonight I'm having a balanced bar chocolate craze protein bar. Very healthy, very nutritious. Still pretty delicious, just not, you know, rendazzles. Make sure to save a plate of, uh, of for me when I, when I get down there in just a few weeks. But we're talking fights, and, uh, and as you said, Armando, the, the Brandon Rios fight with uh, Richard Abril is just the latest reminder of everything that's wrong with this sport. And I do want to say that in the eighth round, I tweeted on the at Box During Dinner, our Twitter page, um, that if you had Richard Abril ahead on your scorecards, you should be prepared to be disappointed. And lo and behold, uh, the, the fight comes to a conclusion. Anybody who didn't catch this, go ahead and look it up on YouTube uh, where it's probably posted illegally and, and watch for yourself and see if you can pick out more than two or three rounds that Brandon Rios might have won in this fight. Um, we've, you know, we appreciate Brandon Rios, who's been a, a friend to our show, but in this fight, he didn't win. Um, the, the biggest loser by far is, is Richard Abril, not just because of the d judges' scorecards, but because of the fact that Brandon Rios is a protected top-ranked fighter. Regardless, uh, win or lose, he was going to be set up for uh, a one win Mel Marquez fight in July. If you don't think that's going to happen, um, money talks, and that's his, one of the exact reasons that this fight turned out the way it did. Uh, Richard Abril not only misses out on the immediate $50,000 bonus uh, that he would have gotten had he won the fight uh, on the scorecards, we know he won the fight in reality, but now he's also going to miss out on, on paydays down the line that would have been his because he would have been the first person to technically thrown, uh, dethrone Brandon Rios. And now he's stuck in this rut. He's not the same you know, fighter as far as promotional stability goes uh, as Brandon Rios is. He doesn't have the same opportunities. This was his opportunity. So another black eye for, for the sport of boxing. And unfortunately, this is becoming more and more commonplace and poor officiating, poor judging. Um, it's just more and more of a black eye for real boxing fans who look forward to these fights and it's ultimately even worse for the fighters who, who put their blood, sweat, and tears out on the line to give themselves an opportunity to advance to the next big thing and then get slapped in the face with something like this. And thanks a lot, David. Uh, as you were saying about the Reels of Bro fight, it's a real tragedy in boxing. Anytime there's a, there's a, a decision that horrible. You know, Richard Abro, he's been on boxing during dinner a few times. We saw how that fight developed how uh, he got himself into this fight starting that ruckus over at the Versailles restaurant here in Miami when Gamboa was supposed to fight Reels. A bro gets a shot, fights a fight of his life, outboxes Reels, and at the end of the day he has nothing to show for it. He gets robbed blind by the judges. Reels will go on to bigger paydays. We don't know what will happen to a bro for now. You know, he's not a top ranked fighter. Will they bring him back on another card? Hopefully they do because he's a really good kid. We're going to talk to him later in the week, uh, Richard Abreu, he's still in Las Vegas when he gets back to Miami. But, David, this is what turns off some boxing fans, because I love the sport of boxing more, more than, than I do my, my own family sometimes. Nah, that's just a joke. But I, I love boxing a lot. And anytime there's a bad decision, it, it, it just turns off people in the sport. You know, people start saying it's fixed, that the judges are bought. I, I, don't, I, I don't think that. I'm not of the opinion that that happens, because I've been sitting next to a person who's judging the same fight I am and they'll, they'll have a completely different scorecard. Happened with when uh, Dale, Dale Brown fought Robert Daniels down here with a writer who was sitting next to me who had, who had Robert Daniels winning the fight. Robert Daniels did not win that fight. It wasn't even close to, <laughs> to winning that fight. And in 93 when 
when Pernell Whitaker fought Julio Cesar Chavez. To me, that's still the worst decision I've ever seen in my entire life. He scored Julio Cesar Chavez, and it, it ended up being a draw. I mean, I don't even know how it's possible for that fight to have been a draw. But I, I really feel bad for Richard Abril. When I watched the fight and I heard the decision, I felt like crying for the kid. The kid didn't even need to cry in the ring. I, I was crying for him over in Miami watching this fight. So, David, you know, in tossing back to you, you know, it, it, it's really screwed up what happened to Richard Abreu. As for what's next for Brandon Rios, um, <laughs> you, you could have predicted this long before this fight happened. A lot of people say now, because of the way that he, he performed in his fight against Richard Abreu, that he doesn't deserve a shot against Juan Manuel Marquez. Um, that doesn't matter <laughs> whether it's true or not. The fact of the matter is he is the biggest money fight available for Marquez. He will get the fight with Marquez in July. Um, these are two top-ranked fighters. If Marquez beats Rios, they'll say, "Oh, you know, it just uh, he, he you know came up up against a great technician who operates as one of the best pound-for-pound -pound fighters in the world." And Rios, you know, will continue on down the line and still pick up big money fights because it doesn't matter <laughs> if you're winning or losing their fights. Just ask Shane Mosley how important it is to actually win or lose fights. He's lost everything that he's fought in the past several years, but he's fighting the biggest name fighters in the sport. It does not matter if you are winning your fights or not. It's who your promoter is. And unfortunately, Brandon Rios, um, who, again, we haven't really spoken too much about this, he's done at 135. He hasn't even made weight at 135 in his last two fights. Um, and frankly, anybody who thinks that he, you know, is, is going to be a different fighter at 140, let's hope so. But if he's coming in and weighing 137 and 138, then he might even struggle thinking he's got a little bit of a cushion to hit 140, and he might even have trouble making that. Brandon Rios has, has not looked good in his last two fights against no-named opponents, and he is just a part of a hype machine, to, to be completely honest. Um, fun to watch most of the time, but he was exposed as what he is. Uh, a very rough around the edges, uh, rugged fighter with uh, with a street fighter's mentality, but very limited skill. And I don't think the story is going to be any different at 140 pounds. Uh, it'd be fun to see him in against guys like Maidana and Lucas Matisse, those those punchers who uh, are also raw uh, in skill set, but very you know rough around the edges. And but yeah, we're going to see Marquez and Rios in uh, in July at Cowboy Stadium. It's a huge fight with two Mexicans going head to head. They're both pay-per-view draws. Uh, this is a no-brainer to me, regardless. I mean, the, people say that maybe Mike Alvarado, because of his performance, uh, deserves a better shot at Marquez or maybe uh, Gesta, the, the other Filipino guy. Yeah, those guys are probably both better candidates for this fight, and neither of them are going to get it. Yeah, David, as you come back to me, I have my food stuff. But how could you not have your food stuff? Look at all this. This is all delicious. Everything I've, I've started eating so far is outstanding. And if you're in South Florida, Rondazzo's Little Italy here in Coral Gables, you'll see the, the address if you want to go, phone number if you want to call and make reservations. You want to come to this place. Not only do you eat this food, but you get to talk to the owner and chef, Mark Rondazzo, who is a former fighter, fought for the World Cruiserweight title, had some regional titles along the way, has, has sparred with some of the best in boxing. And Mark, you, you're a guest for tonight. You're our our honored guest because you know you're we're, we're having the show here it's the first one of many and we, we're gonna start it off with you this weekend on Saturday aside from the fights and aside from that Tupac hologram in Coachella that everybody's talking about they had the the debut of 24 7 with Mayweather and Cotto now Mayweather's become a staple of this show it's gotten people outside of uh, the boxing realm to talk about these fights to talk about Mayweather and Pacquiao it's almost made them into celebrities. What would have happened back in the in the eighties, or let's even go further back. Imagine Muhammad Ali on a twenty four seven. How how would that have even made their careers, their their personalities even greater? Wow, I mean the the, the I mean first of all the show is done so well and it's so informative. Even uh, to, for a non boxing person to watch it, they automatically become informed of the sport of boxing and. Uh, what the fighters' backgrounds are. I think it's great. I think boxing, you know, has always missed that. That's one of the, one of the th things that boxing's evolved into, is you know, it's pulling in you know a, a greater audience because people are educated from programs like 24/7. I mean, imagine a guy like Hagler and Leonard on those. I mean, with those kind of exposés. I mean, it's just a, it's a tremendous uh, piece of uh, videography that uh, it's very very informative and fun to watch. And, 
And I mean, everybody likes it. Who doesn't like it? Nobody's going to change the channel when 24-7's on. And Floyd Mayweather's become the star of the show. And most people I run into do not like Floyd Mayweather Jr. But, but Mark, isn't it better when, when you go into these fights that there's a, a villain? You know, it just makes yeah. the fight a little more interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's good boxing. I mean, in boxing, you either people come to see you because they want you to win or they come to see you because they want to see you get knocked out. And there is a, you know, some people do play the bad guy like Camacho, and it's sometimes it's, you know, maybe even done a little bit on purpose. Mayweather has become kind of, uh, he's kind of bit off more than he could realistically chew. But, um, I mean, you know, Koto coming up, Koto's a nice fighter. Or I would like to see him fight him a couple of years ago. But I think Mayweather, you know, uh, is a great athlete, you know, great fast, you know, great, uh, you know, boxing needs all the hype it can get, you know, it doesn't hurt. I just like to see, um, I'm looking forward to seeing him with Pacquiao and hope it turns out to be the fight that, uh, that it's uh, built up to be. And how good is it when you have a fighter like, <clears throat> like Mayweather, who's, who's a trash talker, you know, Ali was a trash talker, he used to, you know, big, big mouth, he used to say anything and everything to Joe Frazier, but at the end of the day, these are guys that work hard in the gym, <clears throat> they spar, they run, they, they do what it takes to be a champion, and then they show it in the ring, so they back up all the talk. Yeah. Well, Floyd talks the talk, but he, uh, he also walks the walk. You know, he's a great athlete, he's a great fighter, he's got a great heart, and uh, he's just blessed with, you know, uh, uh, speed that, uh, you know, makes the other guy look like he's not even trying. He's just a phenomenal athlete, you know, but you can't take anything away from him, you know. He talks a lot of, uh, he talks a lot of trash, but he does back it up. And we'll talk more about it leading up to the fight, Mark. But Floyd Mayweather against uh, Miguel Cotto, you said you would have liked to have seen this a few years back. D do you think it's a foregone conclusion Mayweather wins this fight, he's just too quick? No, I think Cotto's got a nice style, he's got a nice left hook, and you know, um, you know, I mean the pressure's on the other guy, and whenever you, know, you go in there and there's not a lot of pressure on you, you know, every fighter has one great fight left in him, and you never know when it's going to come out. And it may come out uh, with uh, Floyd Mayweather with Cotto, because he's got a beautiful style. Very well-schooled fighter, nice left hooks, and uh, you know, you never know, you know, <laughs> anything can happen in the ring, you know. And one thing we've seen with Cotto on, on the 24-7s and, and, and all the times that I've interviewed him, to me, as a, as a journalist, he, he's a boring interview because, you know, he's going to tell you the same thing. He's a quiet guy. He keeps to himself. He talks a lot about family, about his, his, uh, his uh, parents, his uh, wife, his kids. You know, he's a, he's a really humble guy. Uh, you, you were telling me that, that Holyfield was kind of like that too, that every time they were trying to sell a fight, they tried to get him to, to say some things that it just wasn't in his nature to say. Yeah, Evander was a very quiet guy and we should do the interviews with Showtime and they used to, you know, cut and say, can you say that like this? And, you know, Evander just was not a confrontational guy and he was just, you know, I don't want to say he was not a marketable guy because his physique and his, uh, his athletic prowess was, you know, was was all he really needed but had he had he been able to sell himself a little more he would have been uh, you know one of the greatest heavyweights ever which he was to me anyway but I mean had he been more a little more marketable talked a little more shit been a little more colorful you know he could have he could have really tripled his earning power I think and he was marketable because remember when he had those uh Holyfield Warrior t-shirts I, I bought one you know I was like 16 <laughs> years old I went I went online and and I bought one of I bought I one of the I shirts. Stole one out of his closet. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I wasn't that close to him to have done it, but you, you know, you're you're in a, you're you're better physically built to have stolen his shirt and maybe not get his ass kicked as, as bad as I would have. You know, Evander was a great guy. I lived with him for four years. I never seen him lose his temper in four years. I mean, the guy's just such a restrained guy. He got great discipline. Uh, just a remarkable guy. Really. And speaking of Holyfield. Mark, you know, you're, you're here in, in, in your restaurant, you know, you're, you, you've, uh, you've already, you know, that, that, that point, part of your life, boxing, it's in the past, at least, at least as a fighter. Now you're, you're a proprietor, you're a chef, you, you know, you deal with the crowd. You, st you, you started a new part of your life, a new era. When you see guys like Evander Holyfield, you know, who, you, who you're close to, and they're still in the ring at 40-something years old, I mean, what, what, what goes through your mind, especially when it's a guy that close to you? Well, you know, I think in Evander's case, I think he really feels that he can beat the heavyweight champion of the world on a good on a good night, and he probably can. But there's a lot of fighters that, you know, 
uh, you know, it's sad to see them still fighting. It's, I, I think it takes somebody close to them to tell them because a fighter never knows. You know, he always thinks he has one more fight in him. It's like a tiger when you pull his claws out. He still thinks he could fight, you know, even though his reflexes, you know, are, uh, you know, compromised. You know, a fighter has, is trained to think positively. And you never think that, you, you never say can't, you never accept the word can't. So somebody around you that cares about you has to pull you out, you know. I had Angelo Dundee and Lou Duva as my, uh, as my trainers, you know, and they kind of taught me, you know, to get, you know, prepare me for life after boxing, which a lot of good trainers do, like Teddy Atlas. They teach your fighters how to, you know, how to prepare themselves for after boxing, how to put, put aside some money. And everything I do in my business, I attribute to boxing, you know, like I, you're only as good as your last fight, your last plate, you know, the discipline of staying on top of, uh, of everything it's it's very similar it's, a, it's like you're in training running a business you know so a lot of good you can learn in boxing that you can utilize towards business and life you know speaking of your last plate this is the last plate you cooked and it's amazing so you are as good as your, as your last plate it's awesome but mark thanks a lot uh you know we'll, we'll be here we'll be here often and uh we're gonna want to feature Mark, you know, behind the scenes, a, a talk we had with, with Mark that we're gonna have on boxing during dinner. We're also gonna have Richard Abril later this week. We're gonna talk to him about that Rios fight. <clears throat> but for now, we'll let you guys go because I want to dig into this plate. It's an amazing plate of food. I've tasted everything so far, and it's out of hand. Again, Rondazzo's Little Italy, over in uh, what, what's the address? Uh, 385 Miracle Mile, Coral Gables, Florida. Walking distance to anywhere, ample parking all over the place, there, there's meters, there's valet parking, you, you name it. But come here and eat at Rondazzo's Little Italy. As for Boxing During Dinner, you know where to find us, BoxingDuringDinner.com. You go to YouTube and search Boxing During Dinner. And write to us on Facebook and on Twitter, at Box During Dinner. And, you know, you can tell us what you want Mark to cook for next week. W would that work? Absolutely. <laughs> Maybe we'll bring some fans. And we're boxing themed at the restaurant. Exactly. As, as, you, as you'll see, when, when, uh, when we have the feature on Mark, we went all over the place. I, I think Alex filmed every single piece of, of, of artwork you have here. But until next time, boxing during dinner. <laughs>